Hello everyone and uh, thank you very much for coming uh, today for this uh, conference given by uh, Jean-Pierre uh, Poulain. So uh, as you may know, this uh, evening uh, lecture is part of a conference I call, called uh, Homme Territoire Société, uh, so uh, Humanities, Territories and Societies uh, in English, which was uh, created in 2016 and uh, which aims to jump into the art, the culture, the history and the politics, economics or archaeology of uh, Indonesia through the eyes and the work of uh, French um, researchers. Um, first I'd like to thank uh, our partners, so the French School for Asian Studies, also known as FAO, who co-organized the event, and the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development, also known as IRD, uh, for their technical assistance. Before we start, a few words um, to present uh, the speaker today, uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Poulain. So he's a professor of sociology at the University of uh, Toulouse Jean Jaurès, uh, and he founded the School of Tourism, uh, Hospitality Management and uh, Food uh, Studies. He is also the holder of the Food Studies Chair at the Taylor's University and uh, his uh, research focuses on the links between food, culture and health. <coughs> so now the floor is yours. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bonjour. Bonjour à tous. Good evening everybody. Salamat Pagi. Bapak Bapak, Ibuibu. Sayat Sangat, Senang Berada, Disini Hari Ini. Sayat Akam, Beri Bacha, Tangat Makanan. That's all. <laughs> I will speak in English. So it's really my pleasure to be uh, with you this evening and uh, uh, to work and to, to, to speak about the question of uh, Indonesian food culture with an S in plural, in transition. And uh, uh, I just would like to, uh, uh, okay, uh, Alice introduce myself uh, and I have. It's really incredible. I find a former student who is uh, here working in a, a, a five-star hotel. He was in the hotel school when I was a, a young lecturer and was in the first batch I have teach. So it's uh, nice to see you. Oh, how many years? Okay, so. Uh, uh, but after this time, I move a little bit and my career has changed and I'm more at the present time working as a sociologist and anthropologist on the transformation of food habits and food culture. And uh, with uh, Professor Ismail, who is a Malaysian uh, uh, professor in nutrition, we are leading an lab international laboratory uh, associate at CNRS about the same food, culture, and health. And we, have, uh, uh, we are developing uh, a program called ASEAN Food Barometer. And we have the chance, and two ladies are here, from Simeo Recfon, uh, to uh, meet the team of Simeo in uh, Jakarta, to work together, and we are just finishing an Indonesian food barometer. What is it? It's a, a survey that tries to understand the transformation, the evolution of the food habits, trying to understand this transformation and the consequence in terms of culture, but also in terms of health. As you know, non-communicable disease, obesity, are uh, uh, problems that the modern society and the modernized society are facing. And in this part of the world, the modernization goes very fast. In fact, what we have faced in Europe in one century, sometimes one century and a half, is arriving here in one or two generations. And these consequences in terms of 
food habit, food culture, urbanization, transformation of the structure of the household, all that change a lot the relation with food. So, in fact, I will uh, use two kinds of data because we have another research program, more classical, with Udayana University on Balinese food culture and heritage, trying to see how uh, this heritage could be uh, valorized and how the tourism development is at the same time an opportunity but also a risk for this heritage. So, uh, a few years ago, we did in, uh, in Bali an international seminar about food heritage. You have here some, and you have here is a team of CMO working on the ASEAN food barometer and an analyze of the transformation of the protein transition, in a few words. It's to try to understand how the developing society, society goes from a stage in which the main source of protein are coming from cereal, grain, and uh, 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 legume, in the case of Indonesia, tempeh. Tempeh and rice in the traditional uh, uh, society, moving toward more and more uh, 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 protein coming from animals source. So, the ASEAN Food Barometer is a, a network, I go fast. Why we start from Malaysia? Because in Malaysia, as you know, there is a, it's a multicultural society with Malay, and the Malays are not far to the Indonesian, even, I know, eh? you are very different. I know that. But there is some common things, Azilema, Krendam, we, we, can, we can develop some common things. There is Chinese, even the Chinese are different, the Chinese of the diaspora are not the Chinese mainland, but there is common things. And there is also Indian, and these di diaspora, Indian and Chinese diaspora, are all over the world. So it's for us, it was for us, because we have worked for two years to develop the methodology and to adapt to this population. Uh, uh, the methodology of uh, the food barometer, that means something that's close to a nutritional survey with a lot of sociocultural <coughs> dimension. So, on this uh, project with CIMEO, we are working with another university, University of Washington, Seattle, uh, and with Adam Drenowski, that you can see here, with the theorization of the nutritional transition. And uh, I will uh, go back on this question later. So that's some uh, picture about uh, a field work in Makassar. Uh, you can uh, uh, recognize uh, uh, Professor Ismail, Yudia, Helda, who are uh, here in the room, uh, uh, Adam Drenowski, and uh, that's uh, work of CIMEO to develop the methodology. Uh, that's a training of enumerator to go on the field to do the data collection. So, and that's a work done in Indonesia, in six main parts of Indonesia. It has a huge country, very difficult to use the methodology that we use in smaller country like the European one. So, uh, uh, our colleagues have uh, used to work with uh, other methodology and we have learned a lot from them. So, just to let you know about what will be the, the, the data and the experience that uh, uh, we will, on, on which I will base uh, my, uh, my talk. I will work in four main uh, 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 times. The first one is to go a little bit in deeper in the relation between food and culture. The second one is to see how the global challenge is organized and what is the Indonesian challenge in this context. Just to start, have a look on the diversity of the food model at the scale of the planet. 
with this very simple uh, 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 radar, you can see, for example, how the Japanese use the fish. You can see how the French, for example, like the meat and the dairy product. You can see how the Colombia uh, uh, have a, a full model based on the roots to bear, pulse, a little bit of dairy. You can see the fish for the Portuguese. So, incredible diversity. And this diversity is driven by cultural factors, religion, taboos, beliefs, <coughs> and the tradition coming from the past. So, let me go on uh, uh, what we can call the food social space. The question is when we would like to do cooperation with uh, nutrition, when we are on the side of social science or on the side of uh, anthropology, is to understand where could be the border and where could be the interaction. And how we can say everybody is okay to say that food is framed by culture. In 64, Roland Barthes and Claude Lévi-Strauss have written very interesting articles about that and everybody can quote them and uh, refer to this work. But it's not so easy, after some small example, to go in depth with this question. Let me uh, uh, start with uh, the fact that as omnivorous, we have a room of freedom. Because we can, in fact, the constraint, the biological constraint for a human being, eater, are not so strong. We have one with the protein and the amino acid. Because we are not able to synthesize certain amino acids, you need to have them in, on a regular basis in the food intake. But these amino acids come from, from milk, from meat, from tempeh and rice, could come from snake, from horse, from dog. In fact, there is a, a freedom for the culture to build a difference and identity. It's the same, for example, for fat acid. It's the same for vitamin and certain micronutrients. We cannot spare them. We need to have them on a regular basis. But it can, they can come from different parts, different kind of food. So this question, the culture, use this room of freedom to build social identity and social difference. We can see this difference at the level of uh, what is edible, what is not edible. I have worked for many years in Vietnam, and at the end of my stay, my colleague in Vietnam invited me for a meat dog meal. Seven dishes of dog. And honestly, they was very respected me, invited me for that. Because they believed that I was able to go beyond my cultural frame to understand what they are doing with that. And I tried to do. But I tried to do, but my mind, I remember one dish, it was a stew, of dog, and the sauce was uh, done with the blood of the dog, and my mouth said, oh my God, it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> if it is not dog, I can take a piece more. And my mind said to me, guy, what are you doing? <laughs> so this question of edible and non-edible is really not only a nutritional factors, it's a cultural factor. It's defined. And it's defined for your life long. It's very difficult to eat something that is not edible in your culture. 
So we can continue. I will do that quite fast because we have a lot to, to say. The food system, oh, Malaysia and Indonesia are closed. But you know the Malaysian, 64% of the Malaysian eat one meal a day outside. And it's absolutely not this data in Indonesia. A lot of people eat at home, but buy the food outside and bring it at home. And these two societies are very close. They share a lot, they share some religion, and so on. We have the same with the Dan Danish people and the Finnish people. The, def the definition of a meal, a lunch, uh, for the Danish is cold, for a Finnish is hot, is warm. And they are very close, culturally speaking. So, culinary, and we will see food culture, fantastic food culture in Indonesia. A diversity, incredible diversity. The consumption pattern. How do you eat? With fork, with finger, with chopsticks. And if, you, if we eat with a finger, it's not because you are not able to pay a fork. And it's not because you are not educated. Because there is a way to eat in a proper way with the fingers. And there is a way to eat not in a proper way. Everything, every way to eat has the proper and the not proper way. So, the time frame, you know, the, the, in Spain, they have a time absolutely different. When we meet, we have a meeting in Toulouse with our friend from Barcelona, it's very close. But the time to eat is absolutely not the same. The French eat for lunch at noon, and the Barcelona people, the Spanish people, eat at 2.33. And when we go in Barcelona, oh my God, we are, we are hungry all the time. <laughs> and when they come in Toulouse, for the meeting, they arrive and we go for lunch. And we are close, we are looking at the same country, we have the same money, and so on. Not the same country. So, and food is uh, used for social differentiation. Food has also consequences, our choice, on the ecological system. Don't believe that we are eating what the nature gives to us. It's much more complicated. When you go in Bali and you can see the rice field, imagine the work that people have done to produce rice. And to make water going, they want to eat rice. We can eat something else. When you take a car in France and you go to see in the, on the countryside, you can see one yard, you can see uh, uh, co and, uh, and beef in the nature, it's because our way to e consider the food is bread and wine and steaks. That means the food culture is a driver for the relation with the nature. But our way to consider the food has some consequences on the environment. The Chinese like very much the shark fish and it's a big problem for the shark but not only for the shark it's a big, a big problem for the ecological system so our food choice have the consequences on the environmental so okay this concept of food model i will stop with the theory after this concept of food model allowed to identify what is defined by culture and to identify the interaction between the culture and the physiological and biological constraint. Here we have one of the most exciting development of the modern science with what we call epigenetic. That means the influence of the habits mainly when the woman is pregnant, on the uh, uh, influence of the expression of the gene of the baby, not only at the 
beginning of the life, but all the life long. And so, what we eat had an influence of the expression of the gene. And here, what we eat had an influence on the ecological system. We will work a little bit on that, because the choice of the protein have certain ecological consequences. So, in fact, three objectives. To understand the relation between culture, nutrition, and environment. The first objective is the health of population. The second one is more a cultural matter. Our commensality, our public policy on, on food, and also living together can be managed through the food. And the last one is the sustainability. So, my first part, going to the global challenge. Everybody knows uh, uh, Malthus' theory. Very simple. Malthus, uh, in the 18th century, at the end of the 18th century, shows that the evolution of the population follow a geometric curve function when the evolution of the food production is following a arithmetic function. And uh, what he said, when these two curves will cross, or when the curve at the right will cross, it will be a big problem for the humanity. This question was uh, in uh, 1972, a warning launched by the Club de Rome about the way of development, where we are going. And uh, this question is a recurrent question. Have a look. Evolution of the population. Follow the curve. And uh, a lot of uh, lanceurs alert. I don't use the English word because it's not the same meaning. The lanceur d'alerte. You can see ici here uh, Josué de Castro, Brazilian, was the first president of the Food and Agriculture Organization. But you can see, for example, at the end of the, at the middle of the uh, 20th century, how we can produce bread for two million of human beings. Oh, the title is fantastic. So the ethnocentrism with bread, not all the people eat bread at the surface of the, of the planet, but have a look, two billion. Okay, the, the evolution, we have success until now to make move this point where the curve will cross. But remember 2008. Perhaps certain of you are a little bit too young to remember that. Mm. What happened in 2008? Remember the price of the meal increased very fast for a while. So the financial speculation, uh, that was the time where the crisis <laughs> of the speculation of the property in the US stop and a, a big part of the money move on the <coughs> food market. Imagine. Between a farmer who produce coffee and a, a big industry like Nestlé producing coffee, the coffee could change sometime more than 300 times of hand. And each time the cost increased a little bit. This speculation, so we rediscover this question. Why I'm speaking about that? Because the choice of the protein we, we are doing have an impact of the quantity of resources that we need to produce. 
depending also on the model of production. If we feed animals with cereal, mm. it's a, a competition with potentially the human being. Is animal eat grass, it transform grass into edible product. And it was not edible at the beginning. So, back to Malthus. That's a global challenge. You can see uh, the food production and uh, for the last 30 years a big work was done in this direction to increase the food productivity. But have a look here, I have changed population by food required. That means not only the quantity of people, but what they eat. And remember, we start with the diversity of the food culture. This diversity is the resources to face the challenge of hunger. Because if we eat all the, the same things, we will have all our eggs in the same basket. And this diversity must be considered as an heritage, a fantastic heritage, not only a romantic one that uh, uh, represents the culture, the influence, it's important, and we will speak about, but it's also a resource to face the challenge that we will have to face in a few decades. So, we can see two complementary way to work, the work on the food habits and the work on the productivity. A part of the work we are doing, and I invite you uh, to read this article, published in an ethical journal about the question of changing the, uh, 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 to analyze the transition between plant-based protein to animal plant protein, written with Adam Drenowski, uh, I present before. So, that's Adam. And this article is quite old article, 1997. Uh, and uh, that's a presentation of the nutritional transition. This idea is very simple. When the development happens, when the purchasing power increase, people eat more and more animal products, more fat product, and more protein product. And you can see here what is the Protein transition is this part of the nutritional transition. The, how we go from vegetal or plant protein to animal protein. Okay, that's the last meeting in Manila working on this question. I can present the, the problem like that. Here purchasing power, here the ratio of animal calorie on the total calorie. And you can see when the uh, society is developing, you have an increase of protein coming from animal and fat. And in the developed society, it's quite stabilized. We can change, for example, in France, we eat uh, less beef, more pork, and more chicken, and poultry. And there is this transformation. And we can see, we can begin to see, in the most uh, developed society, a part of the society, that reduce the quantity of protein coming from animal. Okay, we can uh, represent that uh, in a more simple way. At the bottom of society, more protein coming from cereal, grain, and pulse. And a little bit... Sorry, what is pulse in French? Uh, oh, okay. uh, and here you have... Uh, 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 protein coming from animals. Middle class, you can see this part increasing. And you can see at the top of the developed society a more balance between these different categories. So, you know that. That's very important. You know that uh, plant protein, for example, the beans and the wheat, are unbalanced 
in terms of amino acid protein. In fact, if I eat only beans or only wheat, it's very difficult to have a good intake and a good uh, uh, amino acid uh, um, balance. But if I eat together, because what is missing for the beans is in excess for the wheat. And it's absolutely fantastic to see how the traditional culture have find, empirically speaking, the way to associate pulse and cereal and grain. You have a fantastic example in Indonesia between tempeh and rice. In South America, you have rice and beans. In North Africa, uh, uh, I don't know how to say that in English, uh, 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 somebody can help me, poishij, chick, chickpeas, thank you. With, with couscous. Hey, you, you, you see this association. Thank you very much. So, I finish it's a little bit. We spend the day to, for this calculation to try to understand how we can assess the uh, uh, nutritional and the amino acid profile. So, just have a look about that. Protein coming from plant, protein coming from animal. And you can see different category of food model in the world. And you have Indonesia and you have Malaysia. Uh, but have a look. Indonesia, mainly for the animal protein, mainly seafood, 57%, and other meat and dish. This data date from 2000. We are producing new data and this uh, quantity move in Indonesia. So, this uh, data can help us to do different scenarios for different countries. <coughs> what are the driven of food of protein? And that's why the cooperation between social science and nutrition is so interesting. Because, in fact, the protein are the category where we have the most number, most important number of taboos, of religion prescription, uh, uh, of belief, of value system. So, and uh, uh, it's why this question is so important. It's also a factor of medicalization and nutritionalization in the modern society, food change, the statue of food is changing. Less quantity and less short term relation for a longer term relation. During the first 40 years of the life, we are preparing the disease that we will have later. Cardiovascular disease, cancer, hypertension, and food is uh, implicated in that. In the second part of the life, we have chronic disease, and food is also present in the past, in the tradi traditional society, where when the reason to pass away was an epidemic, food was important to have a baby with a little bit chubby. Because a baby chubby, when he, he becomes sick, he loses two kilo, but he's still alive. <laughs> it's not a problem. So the quantity is a very positive value. And with the modernization, this relation with food is changing. So how we can go from nutrition transition to protein transition, and the protein transition introduces not only taboos, but introduces also the relation with animals that is changing in the modern society. So, what we are doing to study that? We are doing survey that bridge the nutritional approach and the sociocultural approach. Trying to understand what we eat 
and that's a traditional way for nutrition, but trying to understand why we eat that and how we, we can decide to do that. For those who would like to have an introduction to this methodology, you can find that free of charge on internet. So, I will finish with the global challenge, with the question of the modernization of the society in this part of the world. With what certain sociologists in Korea and Japan call the compressed modernity. Compressed modernity means that the speed of the modernization is very, very fast. Urbanization, transformation of the uh, household, emergence of a middle class. So we can see that I move to Indonesia. Transformation of the household <coughs> structure. Have a look. That's the birth rate. 1950, five, six baby per woman. Have a look how it dropped down. But it's not in Indonesia. That's a global trend. The transformation and also cultural factors, religion, can slow down or accelerate this question. The structure of the society. Indonesia is here, and you can see the evolution of the society, and you can see how the society in Indonesia will change because of the transformation of the birth rate. So let me give you some data, and we can compare a little bit with Malaysia. Under nourishment, have a look, the prevalence, Indonesia is going in the right sense in the right direction. But there is work to do, eh? because 3% uh, uh, of uh, 300 million of people, it's a big number. Still a big number. That's obesity, that's Malaysia. Uh, Indonesia is not so high, 8% versus 15. Nothing to see. But the trends is also the same. We can see the average protein Indonesia was missing of protein, 45%, 45 grams per person in 99, 2000, compared to Malaysia. But have a look, you can see the evolution, you can see the transformation of the society. So, protein animal, animal protein, you can see the evolution in Malaysia. Anemia among women of reproductive age, that's an important factor, have a look. We have here Malaysia, you can see, Indonesia, big success, but it started again. So this question is an important question. I will go to speak about the Malaysian, sorry, the Indonesian food culture. Food cultures with S. Okay, we can start with a naturalist perspective. Everybody knows this uh, Alfred Russel Wallace, uh, contemporary of uh, thank you, Darwin, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Wallace was uh, living uh, in uh, Sulawesi, in Malaysia also, and he observed the nature, and he observed that the quantity of animals and the biodiversity on the, the two sides of a line, you can see here, was very different. Very different. In fact, this line uh, uh, goes between Lobok and Bali, and you can see here, and it's interesting to see that there is a, we are really in two worlds, two different worlds. Okay, some hypotheses can develop about that. But one, in terms of nutrition, is we are on this side, Irian Jaya, for example, 
in a, a part of the region where the tuber are a main part of the food model. <coughs> when uh, on the other side, rice has take place. You know the diffusion of rice is a huge, 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 huge question. And for example, there is some very interesting hypothesis that explains that the rice appears as a bad herb in the taro field. Okay, but I will not speak about that, it's too long. <laughs> Just we can see that the first dimension could be uh, a uh, naturalist perspective, geographical perspective. But Indonesia is also an incredible ethnological diversity. Okay, my colleague, anthropologist, identify more than 1,000, 1,300 ethnic groups. To be, to be fair, some of them are very small. In fact, 16 groups represent 85% of the Indonesian population. But it's big. And one of the groups, the Javanese, is more than 40. But big diversity. Big diversity. Religions are different. Even if we compare with, Mal with Malaysia, is, uh, uh, the diversity is bigger in Malaysia. Can I thank my colleague? And I would like to, uh, uh, I would like to add also Yudia. Uh, uh, and uh, okay, this colleague working on the history of the food models in this country. I will invite you to read this book and to read the work they did. They try to understand the different time frame of the influence that have slowly built uh, uh, the uh, uh, Indonesian food culture. Some references. I will now invite you to have a look on the food habits as an heritage. And I will make the distinction between two categories, three categories of heritage. The first one is a living heritage. It's what you can find in the street, what you can find in the family, what you can find in the restaurant. That means that's a recipe that everybody can eat. Living heritage but looking at it as an heritage. The second one is the idea of sleeping heritage. What is it? It's what my grandmother is able to remind when she speaks about what his own grandmother was telling to her. Can you imagine? My grandmother, his grandmother, four generations, four, five generations in the memory. Could be also the historical work. We can work in a novel. The novel has not the purpose to present, to speak about food, but they will present some context, social context, and we learn about that. And we have to do to wake up this heritage because it's a part of our culture. And we can construct a new heritage. And it's the work of the chef to develop innovation in the frame of a culture. Okay, a part of the Indonesian culture. You can see that. That's a living heritage. Not sleeping, this one. I dream to be able to carry the, the plate like that. What? What a no-ho! Okay, uh, going from the street to the restaurant, to the canned food, with this jackfruit, eh? good age. Okay, that's a Bali food for tourists. 
But the Bali food is a, a little bit different for people living in Bali. Oh, Bebek. <laughs> Who like Bebek? <laughs> yes. And for, for the French, it's incredible. The French from the south of France, they love Bebek because it's very close to uh, the Confit Canard. Very close. And, uh, okay, that's very interesting to see the Bebek from Bali becoming a, a, a sim restaurant. Wow, I went there two days ago. I eat that. It was one of the best dish I eat this year. We are only in February. <laughs> <laughs> but incredible, be back with a curry of mangustin. Oh my God. How can I live before, I don't know, before knowing that? Without knowing that? That's what kind of heritage? It's mixed, but that's not an heritage. That's an innovation. But this innovation is an innovation in the spirit of the food culture of Indonesia. Can we continue? You have chef, <laughs> celebrity chef. Can we continue? Just a little bit of theory. <coughs> In fact, to analyze the food culture, we need to understand how the culture of the elite disseminates, diffuses in the culture, in the society. But uh, sometimes you can see some very basic dishes from the street from the family can be changed and go up in the society. And the nouvelle cuisine for the chef is a way to take an inspiration from the popular cuisine. And there is influence. For example, the French gastronomy today and the French cuisine is very influenced by the Japanese one and reciprocally. And the West, the influence of West on East in terms of cuisine is very important. So, what, what happened? <laughs> Sorry. Ah, Michelin is not good for Indonesia. <laughs> it's not fair. It's not fair because there is incredible restaurant in this country. But some of them get a Michelin star. This one in Bali. This one in uh, Jakarta. Bali too. Oh. <coughs> so, Bali is terrible eh, for uh, 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 hospitality industry. <laughs> terrible. So, uh, have a look on the food. That's uh, uh, an internationalization of the gastronomy, but this one is more heritage. Okay, that's more local food. Okay, that's a culture. Can I go back to my protein? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was more interesting eh, to see the Michelin star restaurant. Okay, have a look. That's Malaysia, you have a look, 50% versus 45, that's a put animal protein. Wow, we are in Indonesia. And the quantity of protein coming from plant is still very high. We can analyze that to understand how it is changing. Let me, okay, let me give some word about that. 
I'm not saying that uh, we have to uh, eat only plant protein. It's not my purpose. My purpose is to say uh, this mix, that is a part of the culture, we need to look at it positively. We can, besides that, have animal protein. You can be vegetarian if you want. It could be a choice. But we can eat meat. But this choice and this part of the food culture in Indonesia, it's an incredible good thing for the environment and for the quality of the amino acid and for the cost, because it's got less. So, how we can have a look, not as something coming from the past, I speak for the young generation, but for something that is a part of your culture. Oh, you can continue to develop, and but it's a way to balance. Oh, I will give some word to finish about the tourism. In Bali, there is a lot of tourism. In Indonesia, more and more. And uh, you know, a tourist is uh, have to eat three times a day. And uh, it's incredible how the way to eat and the food culture is a way to enter in the local culture. It's an incredible opportunity to transform a tourist as a passive guy who is looking to an actor that tests the quality of the life, the, the test of the life of a culture. If we have that in mind, we don't, say, we don't sell only tempeh, but we sell any story. We are giving the opportunity for the tourist, to the tourist, to go straight in the earth of our culture. That's fantastically interesting. Okay, I like, you know, Edgar Morin he was my PhD supervisor, and I like this sentence. When he said, a meal change a tourist from spectator to an actor to an actor. And uh, food is a formidable machine, engine to travel. By eating, you can go in a culture. So, <coughs> working on the food culture, developing the knowledge on this uh, field, give to you a better understanding of people coming in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in Asia, give to you the possibility to facilitate to go in your culture, to understand your culture, and also to push the development of certain market, uh, because of what we, regarding the ethnic groups, understanding that uh, the tourism have a before, during, after experience. How we can help people to do that? How many documentaries are done now about food that allow to discover a country? Oh, I would like to go there. And I would like to go to see and to eat that. And the dissemination. So, my conclusion. And we can discuss a little bit. My conclusion Studying food culture is useful for nutrition and health. It could be a bit boring sometimes. But it's important. Tourism and hospitality. And I'm happy to see my colleague. My former student. Uh, food policy, food security, food safety, food crisis agroeconomy and cultural policy. 
Thank you very much. If you'd like to read a little bit more. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Pierre, for your presentation. Uh, now we are going to start the Q&A session. So if you have something you want to ask uh, Jean-Pierre, please raise your hand. I will ask to my two colleagues to join me for the Q&A session. Don't be shy. Please, Yudia and Ella. already <laughs> so uh, we are from uh, the organization called CMEO RECFON it stands for Southeast Asians Ministers of Education organization uh, we are on the center called the regional center for food and nutrition uh, our activities is mostly in uh, research uh, training and community development so uh, currently on research we have um, several projects. One of them is the one we did with uh, Prof. Jiang uh, for the protein uh, sociocultural uh, research on protein transition. Uh, so we have a lot of experience doing that because we are mm, basically we are nutritionists. Uh, and works more on nutritionalization and medicalization of food. So we have a lot of surprises doing sociocultural maybe. Uh, but also actually um, um, we have done uh, several uh, qualitative studies on food as well. Uh, mostly on the uh, uh, on adults and on more on the uh, uh, on the transition and food choice among adults. Uh, on the trainings, we have several um, postgraduate trainings uh, related to foods and also we have community development programs, uh, mostly works with the Ministry of Education, so we are working on projects on nutrition goes to school in several locus in Indonesia and also uh, on early childhood care nutrition and education uh, for uh, the under five children at, in the community level as well as in uh, early childhood um, in the PAUD, PAUD? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> early childhood uh, uh, education uh, okay, so stalling the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Yudi. Um, at Simio Recphone, we have a y unit called uh, Knowledge Management and Partnership. So I am managing that particular unit. So coming here at the, the institute, we carry aside from working uh, currently with uh, Jean Pierre, but also. Uh, to see actually more potential to work with French government because French government is actually one of our uh, associate member countries for uh, CMEO as an organization. So CMEO uh, organization is based actually in uh, Bangkok. We have 24 specialist institutes and RECFON is specializing in food and nutrition. Altogether in Indonesia we have seven CMEO centers so we would like to invite you to uh, visit our website simio.org or simiorecfon.org to to know more or follow our Instagram simiorecfon <laughs> to see more what we are doing and see find uh, try to find uh, what we have something in common and then collaborate more I think thank you I think 
try to discuss now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Could you could you give the? Yeah. Good evening. Okay. Good evening. I'm over here. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm Sylvia. Um, my, 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 my question is, uh, what has made human migration in a big number, um, in this particular from Middle East to, uh, to Europe? Um, how's the change of uh, food culture as the impact of uh, human migration in modern era? Thank you. Interesting question. Uh, uh, when we migrate, we move with our own food culture. And we move with our value, our way to, to look at the, at the food. If I understand well your question, and, and uh, there is two dimensions in your question. The first one is what are the consequences of the migration on the food habits of the people, and how food could be a factor of migration. <laughs> so the first dimension is very interesting to understand how <laughs> when you arrive in a new country you have to reorganize your Sorry. food habits. Thank you very much. But how when a family arrives in a new country it changes the food habits of the village from where the family is coming. Because when people go back, they bring back uh, sometimes food, sometimes tools to cook food. And we are working, we work a lot for migration between Morocco and France, Mali and France. And we can see how the, there is a double influence. And how there is a back influence on the society. Uh, 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 and the village, the town, where the people are coming from. But the second part of the question, if I have well understood, uh, uh, with, uh, you have understood that behind this question, the question of the climate change and the transformation of the climate could change the way to produce food in different parts of the world and could be the shortage of food could be a factor of migration. It's not only negative in certain part, it could be uh, 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 positive, but in certain part of the, of the planet, it could be a factor. So, migration is like tourism. We move with, with our food culture. And there is a certain part of the world that are fantastically interesting. I don't know if you know this small French Iceland over sea department called La Réunion. La Réunion is an island near Mauritius. 700,000 people. Very small. But it's a mosaic. Incredible mosaic. First, nobody was there when we discover this island. Nobody claims to be at the origin. And you have European people, you have African people, you have people from Madagascar, you have people from India, Hindu people, Muslim people, people from China, people from Vietnam, because of the history of the French colonization. And all that have developed an incredible food culture called the Creole food culture. Each community have a common number of dishes, and each community has its own dishes, connected with the uh, homeland, and uh, it's really interesting, this phenomenon, how a new culture can emerge in the uh, 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 interaction between different cultures. The connection with, between West and East at the present time uh, uh, is also an interesting question. So, we can move to another question. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm Virginia Kadarsan. Uh, I'm graduated from France too. 
nutritionist, but now I'm uh, like shifting to gastronomy and in, in the Ministry of Tourism. Uh, not too bad, eh? <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> um, okay. Just an interesting, I would say, I don't know, statement. Statement like the preservation, conservation of the food heritage, is actually has two benefits. One is for, I would say, now gastronomy tourism, and now the Minister of Tourism is working on that. And also, this is this. I think I need clarification. Is the resource. Uh, towards challenge on food supply. I mean, this is interesting because we also talk about biodiversity. Exactly. And some people does not agree with this malnutrition if they, you know, do the, the foraging, something like that. So, because uh, this would be um, uh, encouraging or emphasizing whatever, let's say, now what we are doing with the gastronomic tourism. So, one's economic, but also uh, preservation. Um, and the other question for Indonesia, like, you know, there's two sides, uh, those who eat rice and those who eat tubers. And I think in Indonesia we do like, if people do not eat rice, they're just like left behind. You know, so uh, sago, you know, actually they're good. I mean, I don't know, maybe Ibu can, can respond to this. And the third question is the combination of beans and wheat is interesting while Indonesia is still majority is eating that while actually our rice right now so called is not as good like before when we eat tempeh and rice they can go to university the brains is okay but now rice is kind of it's only carbs so I don't know where I mean maybe again to Ibu from Samuel okay we'd like to start with uh, the rice <laughs> Protein in rice. Okay. Um, the question on the uh, the rice here. Yeah. Um, actually, from from what I read from history, uh, it's correct that uh, initially, actually. Uh, all Indonesian, uh, so rice is actually a uh, 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 plant that was introduced uh, in the country, yeah, because before we don't have rice, so rice comes with the uh, coming with the migration of the uh, to the eastern part, yeah, uh, only to Sulawesi, to Sulawesi. Uh, we did find that um, during the uh, qualitative study, uh, they consider meals as eating with rice. Some of them were considered meals as eating with rice. So, yes, there is transition and uh, also the consumption of tubers was uh, very small, actually. A question about the quality of the protein in the modern rice. Uh, uh, that was a part of the question. Eh? Uh, okay, you, you can give some word about this question, this, uh, this question, Enda? Yeah, uh, the quality of protein. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, the quality of protein. Uh, rice has a lack of several amino acid uh, in rice, so uh, uh, to be able to fulfill the amino acid requirement in uh, uh, the body, it has to be complemented with other uh, uh, other source of protein. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the only uh, food which has the perfect protein uh, amino acid content is eggs. So that's why uh, the protein quality was measured as the percentage toward the eggs consumption. Okay. So you can continue to discuss yeah, about yeah. this question. Uh, uh, there was another dimension of your question. It was the biodiversity and how taking into account the heritage is not only a way to promote the culture and to promote the tourism, but it's also a way to protect the biodiversity. This idea is very strong. I would like to develop it for a while. 
You know, food culture and the diversity is uh, how to use some plants, some uh, produce, some food to do a dish. And this knowledge is a knowledge that only, not only in the cuisine, it's a knowledge on the product. And when you use, you use product, you protect, you feed people who produce this product. And you protect, you protect the biodiversity. Perhaps some of you knows, know the slow food movement. And the slow food movement was uh, developed by one of my colleagues, a sociologist uh, from Italy. And slow food is a joke. He was drinking a beer on a, in Roma, in Italy, on the plaza where there was building a McDonald's. And he was joking, fast food, fast food. We don't want fast food, we like slow food. <laughs> it was a joke at the beginning. But what means so slow food for, for uh, 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 the movement? Is to say, okay, we can focus on all these categories of food that in different villages, in different regions, people have slowly uh, developed. And this knowledge, when we protect this knowledge, when we help people to appreciate, to continue to eat this product, in fact, you are protecting all the chain of people we are doing, from the small baker, cooker, cook, uh, until the farmer. And you protect, after the farmer, you protect the biodiversity. So, you know what we are do, trying to do, and what you are trying to do, with the question of protecting this kind of heritage, is fighting with the concept of convergent modernity. The idea is that uh, all over the world, the lifestyle will become the same. The westernization of the... No, 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 it's not true. No, it's not true, and it's not interesting. Because it's much more interesting to be able to protect the different food culture. But I can... I am interested by your culture. You can be interested by mine. No need to close your mind. And uh, doing that, we are protecting the biodiversity. And doing that, we are not putting all our eggs in the same basket. And it becomes a resource to face the challenge of feeding the world. Because if we eat all rice or bread, and if there is a problem for climatic reason, war, other reason, we will, we will have to face a big issue. If we have a different way to eat, different model, so it will be a way to face this situation. At your disposition to push this idea more and more if needed. Thank you for the question. Before the third question, maybe please kindly pose a simple question so that more questions will be responded by Prof. Uh, OK, yeah. it's a way to ask me to be short. No, 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 the question. Not <laughs> <laughs> so third, uh, third question with the one with make, yeah. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Good evening. <laughs> I'm Judith Jari Nasution. I'm from Salif Hidayatullah State Islamic University, Jakarta. Uh, after hearing your explanation about food culture, I have a question for you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. In your slide, you said acknowledge of food culture in Indonesia. It is to improve the coming of tourists to facilitate access to, inter to Indonesian culture. So, it is a daily obligation if visiting country. My question is, what is the different food culture 
between Malay and Indonesia to encourage to not only increase our agroeconomic but also to knowledge to improve our knowledge about food culture. Thank you. Very interesting question. Thank you very much. You know Nazi Lemak for Malaysian? Nazi Yundu for you? It seems to be the same or quite the same. But it's really different in the way to use it. Nazi Lemak we can say come from the Malay part of the Malaysian society. But uh, every mo every community, Chinese, Indian, Malay, eat Nazi Lemak. Not every morning. But it's a part of the Malaysian culture. Diversity, but we can say that the culture, the food culture, is not only the food, is what we do with the food. In your society, it's a little bit different because a big part of the community is Muslim. And uh, culturally speaking, closer to the Malay than the Indian or the Chinese. That means if we have to defend, for example, an inscription at the UNESCO World Heritage of Nazi Lemak for the Malaysian, the argumentation will be totally different than if you would like to do it for the Indonesian. Even the dish are quite the same. But the social and cultural practices around the dish are different. So I try with this example just to, to uh, uh, make understand that a food culture is a food, is a way to prepare, but is a way to eat, and the consequence, the social consequence of the consumption of this food. In fact, around the food, we are putting in scene. Putting in scene means we are showing what are the core values of a society. And in a very simple way, this core value, <coughs> by learning how to eat, a young guy is in corp, in body, is learning how to act in his society without any big discussion. What is the role of woman? What is the role of man? What is good in this society? What is not good? What can I do with the hand, without the hand? What can I show of my body? All that will be learned without any discourse around the food habits. And so, uh, in fact, it's very small things. But when we move from a culture to another one, mm. we can see how it could be sometimes mm. impossible to, uh, uh, it, it could be very uh, uh, um, uncomfortable to see something. For example, the fact to uh, some noise of the body. In certain society, you can make noise. <coughs> In other society, it's difficult. And it could be you as di disgusting. So, uh, in short, the question of the food culture is uh, all the dimension of the social use of food to build commensality, to build social link, link and uh, it changed from one society to another one. And the example of Nazi Lemak show how we can put and show the multicultural dimension. For example, the Malaysian, you have a taxi driver, you, sp you speak what? As a foreigner, how oh, you can define a Malaysian? Oh, he speaks several languages. He is able to understand, he eats Nazi Lemak. And he is able to eat the food of the other community. 
Thank you for this question. Thank you. Very nice presentation, uh, Dr. Poen. My name is Ferry. I used to be a chef uh, back in the States in the 1980s. Uh, that's why I kind of food is my religion too. Uh, I also graduated from a hotel school in Bali. So uh, tourism is also in the blood. And now uh, also involved in the Indonesian Essential Oil Council. I'm as uh, Vice Secretary General and uh, I produce oils that can also can be eaten, can be consumed. And I'm also working in the food ingredients uh, company. So it's quite complete actually. Mm -hmm. And I, I know Pak Irdika Manso very well. So I, w I will maybe one, one of the time uh, go to your uh, places too. <laughs> so um, my question is simple. Uh, I just now browsing uh, in the Google website. How many Indonesian restaurants are there in uh, France? Come out only six. Okay. Indonesian only restaurant si in France? Indonesian restaurant in France. Okay. <laughs> only six. And then uh, all of them are in Paris. Okay. And only three are actually only pure serving Indonesian food. The other three combined with Malaysian, Singaporean, Chinese, Vietnamese. Okay, so the question is, uh, why Indonesian food uh, cannot be found in you know, less popular big cities or major, uh, maybe you know, Paris, New York, you can easily find it. But uh, I just returned actually just two days ago from uh, uh, Tanzania, from East, Tanzania, East Africa. So. The ambassador over there asked me, uh, can you, and it's also this is an announcement, maybe public announcement, anybody would like to open a restaurant, Indonesian restaurant, in here, in their restaurant. You know? So this is, this is really, because everybody uh, is asking, actually my, my diplomats, uh, colleagues and everything, uh, how where can we find Indonesian food? So why we are not uh, expanding uh, I mean Indonesian food to uh, many other parts in the world, like uh, you can find Thai restaurants in, in Dar es Salaam, but why not Indonesian food, for example? Thank you. Thank you very much. We will try to answer. Uh, how many Indonesian restaurants in Amsterdam? <laughs> Only 12? <laughs> yes, I think much more. I think much more. In fact, that's a, a part of the historical question, but uh, uh, issue and uh, but it's really a question the question of uh, Asiatic restaurant Asian restaurant in Europe for example we have a lot of Chinese Vietnamese restaurant but you know, for many years I, I, I have worked with Vietnamese colleagues. When they are coming in France, we go to a Vietnamese restaurant. It was more exotic for them than for me. <laughs> because what we, we, we eat in a French Vietnamese restaurant has nothing to see with what we eaten 20 years ago in Vietnam. Not exactly the dishes. But the way to eat. For example, it's the same in London. The way to eat in a Vietnamese uh, uh, a meal, you have rice and you put food around. There is no individualization at that time of the dishes. For example, when Vietnam restart to open in 92, 91, and the first tourists arrive, they used to eat in the Vietnamese restaurant in Paris. They ask for the menu, and they ask for soup, for nem, for duck, and the waiter was looking at them. He said, wow, these people must be very angry. <laughs> because they ask for nem, 
God, there was a dish of name for everybody. Mm. And we share that on the lazy Suzanne, you know, this uh, 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 turning. Uh, uh, and, uh, okay, in fact, the Vietnamese and the Chinese have the incredible marketing intelligence to adapt the Vietnamese food habits to the structure of the French meal. First dish, second dish, dessert. There are no dessert in Vietnam. But you have uh, banana with uh, 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 Okay, fried banana and so on too. So my colleague Vietnamese said, okay, what is it? It seems to be Vietnamese, but nothing to, to see with Vietnam. And what happened a few years ago with the tourism? The influence of the tourists on the food habit in Vietnam. For example, 20 years ago in Vietnam, we eat Nhoc Mam, never soya sauce. So yes, yeah, sauce was for Chinese. Even we Cambodian can discuss. Never for Vietnamese. You go in a restaurant in Hanoi or in in Saigon, you have Nhoc Mam and so yes, yeah, sauce. And you ask to a young, 20 years old Vietnamese, he said, okay, why not? The guy, 40, 50 years, he said, wow, so yes, yeah, sauce, wow, not good smell bad. I don't like that. How it change? So that's a very interesting question. How the retro influence between uh, uh, the international market, but your question was why with a so strong culture we cannot disseminate it more. Fantastic success for the Japan cuisine. Japanese cuisine? I think that's a very good question. You need to work together with the people from uh, 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 the Ministry of Tourism to develop the... Monsieur Poulain. Yes. There is something I want to tell in. Please. Something you need to open a restaurant, wherever it is in the world, is customer. And I'm sorry, but I'm not sure you have customer to eat Indonesian food in Tangier yeah, or in Paris. And if you look at Bali, okay? I was in Bali last weekend. Sorry, I burned some carbon to go there. I feel guilty, but it's still nice to go from time to time. What do you find in Bali now that you did not find even two years ago? Indian restaurant everywhere. Why? Because you have Indian tourists. All right? So, and, and the Japanese cuisine has spread also with the Japanese tourists traveling. So it's also when Indonesians travel abroad that they, they will, when they become a major force in, in world tourism, that they will bring their cuisine because they will want, you know, I've been traveling to to Macau with, uh, and uh, Hong Kong with some Manadonese friends. They brought their own food because they were not interested to eat Hong Kong food or Macau food. They were interested to have their, their spicy food, rawong and all that you know, <laughs> while traveling to Hong Kong, and the Indian do the same, and the Chinese do the same, and the Australian in Bali do the same. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> you need a customer? Yeah. We need the customer, right, but we, to need the customer, uh, it's interesting this question, we, we need to interest the customer, that means we, we need not only food, is not only food, Food is uh, 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 more than, and how we can sell more than food? That's the question. Uh, uh, how uh, uh, we, we can have a strong image, and how the customer could be interested by that? Uh, working on the heritage is a way. Using the celebrity chef is a way. Challenging going in the big competition for the chef is a way. This year, the Malaysian in the Bocus d'Or have won the past three competition. It's not nothing. For many years, many years, there was 
at the end of the of the ranking. And suddenly everybody said, oh wow, there is a pastry chef in Malaysia and he changed the vision. So in fact, how we can recognize and make happen the fact that people who like to become a customer of your uh, uh, food habits. Time to go to eat, no? <laughs> Macan, Macan. I have one, one more question. One question? On the mattress. Please, please. I'm uh, quite concerned about the, the future of this planet, although I won't be there to see, but when is tea going to happen in, according to the studies about the Malthus line and the crossing of the line? When, when is it expected to happen? Is it, uh, is it happening at the moment? No, 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 no. We are far, far from that. Uh, we are far from that. At the present time, we produce at the scale of the world enough food to feed 12 billion of people. But we put in a bin more than 30% of the food that we are producing. And we have more than 1 billion of people we have we face problem of shortage of food. But it's not a problem of quantity. It's a problem of accessibility to food. Economical problem repartition of the food. Okay, just uh, this question is very important question. In fact, for many years, we have uh, successfully produced more and more, increased the productivity of food. The question of the lady from the ministry was about that also. The quality of the food and the question of the rice we have now very high productivity with the rice, certain category of rice, but certain micronutrients or macro macronutrients like protein are not exactly the same quality. But not to bad to have food, eh? we, we need to see after. So, we produce much more. And what we can see, we can see that from the Club de Rome, when people said, be careful, we are going in the world. In fact, the trap, the trap is the, the place where the cross, the, 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 the curve are crossing. Move, 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 move. But perhaps it will be continue all the time. And what I try to develop, the idea I have developed with you is uh, the way to eat can change a little bit the things. That means a little bit, not for you, because uh, you are in a, 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 in a stage of uh, uh, the protein transition when you can eat more protein coming from animal. But in the most developed country, eating less, probably better, uh, 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 animal product, it's a way to reduce the impact on the uh, environment. That means, okay, I will give you just an example to finish. When we feed grain, we have to produce grain, and to get one gram of protein, we will use seven grams of grain. No problem if we, are, we, if we have place and if we are not allowed. But this question will change the way to produce. If you have an animal who eats something that is not eatable by the human being, or if you have an animal who eats the, ex the overproduction, the animal transform, something we can lose, in food, that's very important. And the traditional model studied by the anthropologist is a way to show how the relation between animals and human being in the, for example, in Irian Jaya, where they produce a lot of uh, tuber, is a, a seasonal production. 
the animal who eats the tuber is a way to spare and to use the food another moment of the, of the year. So we have to analyze that as a resource. We have developed a few years ago some bio bank of the cereal, of the plant, to keep as a, a, a heritage of biodiversity. It's the same for cuisine. The cuisine is a way to, to use the natural product and uh, it's a resource and it's a, a solution. We can develop ethno-culinary bank to develop and to protect all the use we can do with uh, the different product we can eat. It's useful and it's good. We can do gastronomy with that also. Thank you very much. Perhaps we can give to her. Thank you very much for the people who have organized this event in the dark or in the light, in the shadow or in the light. I know it's a, a, a big work for everybody. Thank you and thank you for you to be here. Uh, I hope we can have the opportunity to uh, mix another time. To, to mix, to, uh, meet another time. Have a good evening and uh, bon appétit.